song. Hi, Alex. Hey, Joey. How's it going? <laughs> good. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thanks. Good, good. You uh, is that your home office you're in? Yeah, it's the only um, safe place in the house, really. So. Um... <laughs> <laughs> that's so good yeah I take it that's been quite busy because you've been doing quite a lot of these broadcasting videos I've seen you on various uh, uh, digital uh, channels like YouTube and all sorts uh, it's yeah, good to have a play. we are at the end of a, a farm track and uh, broadband is virtually non-existent so we rely on um, we rely on 4G which is good yeah oh I remember those days. It was the same living down in the West Coast. The, the Wi-Fi wasn't always so reliable. And when it was there and everybody just accepted that it's time and that's it. Yeah, that's fine. Pace of life, slow down. <laughs> so thank you so much for spending a little bit of your evening with me chatting. And uh, hopefully there'll be a few people joining us. In fact, there's a bunch of us already and a bunch of people watching already. So thank you so much for that. That's um, very good. <laughs> <But> no, thanks, <laughs> I think, uh, go on all <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah I just my, my the whole day my head has been buzzing because I have so many uh questions for you about like a bit like who 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 you are and where you come from but also obviously Arden and Merkin the the story behind that and now coming of age or it's been of age for a wee while but you know obviously lockdown uh, so there's a bunch of questions I'm hoping to try and keep it within my hour <laughs> and I have my trusty timer that I used yesterday and it failed completely because I ran out of time. <laughs> well, I, I, if it goes over an hour, I'll do a Charlie McLean and go and boil an egg and just leave, <laughs> leave you looking at the blank screen. <laughs> Has he actually done that? <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely perfect. Um, it could have been better. But yeah. And he gets away with that kind of thing, wouldn't he? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I know, and you would too, to be fair now. Um, <laughs> You'd be, and you know what? You could just lift up little Noelle up for us, the little uh, your your pet chicken. Well, no, she's uh, convalescing next door actually. So if you hear a squawk, it's um, it's her waking up. Or I'm not quite sure what. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well look, you, so you're um, you're an MD of Arno Market Distillery and Adelphi Distillers or Adelphi's um, selection. But the way I know of you is <laughs> you you're that. You're the brand ambassador. You do fi You probably help with the finance. Uh, you've been sourced, like you, you're doing all the technical digital stuff as well. I, I suppose Kono, you've got Kono as well, but you seem to be doing quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> so it's not just like uh, bossing people about. You're, you're very much hands on uh, when it comes to what you do with the distillery and the, the uh, independent bottler. Yeah, I mean, it's, it just, it's been a nice um, evolution, I suppose is the, is the right word. When I joined Adelphi, um, about almost 16 years ago now, um, there were just two of us. And we had, I think from memory, about a couple of hundred bottles and three casks in, in our Really? Yeah. Is that true? Oh um, my goodness. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been great. And it's been a really nice um, sort of progression, if you like. Yeah. Um, there's now 28 of us, a full count, if you include the distillery. So, but you know, everyone, everyone who's part of the team it's a team you know we all uh, are passionate about what we do and we all are our roles for very much crossover with each other so um yeah yeah but i do like to get involved in as much as possible um i know because you go to these fairs which to be fair they quite they can be tiresome <laughs> but you still go away and you do all these uh, trips and shows obviously not now during lockdown but um yeah you're Wherever there is a whiskey show, you usually see yourself or Conal up there. So that's nice. Yeah, no, we, we try and get out there. Um, yeah. It has, it has actually been really good doing these virtual um, online events. It's been really yeah. exciting. You can reach people so easily. Um, I mean, we did, we did a, well, certainly our first ever online uh, virtual whiskey dinner uh, just a couple of weeks ago with uh, Chris and Marion Pepper who run, um, well, it's called Mr. Peppers now, but he's basically a, a chef in Germany. And he, makes, he has the most fantastic palate. And he, he pairs whiskeys, uh, sorry, he pairs his menu to, to the whiskeys you supply him. Um, so normally yeah. we'd be sitting around in his restaurant in Darmstadt uh, doing a, a dinner for 30 people. But this uh -huh. time he sous vide, he sent out sous vide aid parcels of all the food, the menu, including to <laughs> myself in Scotland. 
uh, so sadly. It's like thought really hard about what yeah. travels where. And so, we, I mean, that's a great technology, technology to be using for that kind of thing. It, it works so well. So we're there, we were in front of 50 or 60 Germans having dinner, literally. And um, thank God, one of my daughters who was at hand, she was doing all the kind of boiling of the sous vide or, or reheating and, yeah. and supporting me with the food as we, as we tasted our whiskey. Sadly, Connell, who lives up north, uh, his parcel didn't arrive in time. So he had to sit there watching us eat. <laughs> <laughs> That's a shame. So um, did, it, did it arrive a few days later? It arrived the next day, a very hot day, looking a bit sorry, and it went straight in the bin. <laughs> oh, what a shame. Oh, dear. I know he's up in there, isn't he? So, I mean, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough. <laughs> Oh, so somebody's asking what was the, what was the dinner, um, what was in the sous vide, what had it made? Oh, right. Um, so he's famous for his soups. So we had one oh. course with the soup. And, you know, there's always a boat at the end for your favourite whiskey, uh, your favourite course and the favourite pairing. Uh -huh. And I think, I mean, I've been doing these for about 10 years now with them. The soup always wins as, as the favourite course. Um, but look, we had, oh, from memory, we had... Um, uh, oh, meatballs. We had uh, hot smoked salmon in in um, uh, like a kind of seaweed wrap. Uh, mm. We had a delicious chocolate brownie to finish with a with a whiskey very similar in colour to that. Um, oh no! And yeah, it was just great, and it went on for about three hours. I mean, we had we didn't just have uh, virtual online fatigue; we had proper food fatigue as well by the end of it. Yeah, you pro like proper Christmas dinner where you're tired, yeah. you're sitting back with like full coma almost. Oh, lovely. Yeah, that is so nice. I've never heard that. I mean, I've heard people have been very creative in lockdown, haven't they? I spoke yeah. to Scott Adams on yesterday, who was one of the first to come up with the That's lockdown festival. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And he said, he thinks they got a bit, I mean, obviously he's been... Um, humble I think that was a great idea and it was him and Roy that came up with it but he said they'd been in lockdown for a week before everybody else because they closed a bit earlier at Tomatin right. they felt like they had been locked down for longer than everybody else they knew they had to do something yeah. but just that being forced to think about something different and just challenge yourself a bit more, it's easy to do this just to chat but uh, to, to yeah. cook a meal and send it across Europe that's pretty <laughs> phenomenal <laughs> no, so, no. I'm not sure what's next on the on the scale of lockdown um, sort of excitement, but we'll see. Bonanza. <laughs> I know. Oh, great. So here, uh, Alex, I know you've been working with Adelphi, you said, for 16 years, but where were you before? What, what did you, you you're from, are you from Edinburgh, first of all? Sorry, I was uh, Yeah, Yeah, Fife, so not far away, just, just over the bridge. Um, okay. Kingdom. Yeah, the Kingdom of Fife, hey. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I've kind of always been in alcohol. It sounds terrible, but it, it, it's true. <laughs> Um, we need us. I did. I dabbled in mechanics before that as well. I um, pretty much straight out of school. I uh, uh, like we all do in those days. You know, we have this kind of banger of a vehicle to try and get to a, a to B, and it kept on breaking down. And I think I could afford about two breakdowns. And on the third breakdown, um, I pleaded poverty to the to the garage, and he said, "Right, well, you can paint the garage, and I'll do the repairs." So it was like the fourth rail bridge. I got to the end of it, you know, the painting. It took me about two weeks. And then he said, right, you can come and help service this car. And then it just went from there. And, and nine months later, I was a pretty much fully qualified apprentice mechanic. <laughs> so when was this? Um, just out of school? I'd, I'd, take it, I'd done a bit of travelling, but that was after that, yeah. Wow. Um, and it was brilliant. It's the best thing I could have, ever have done. A uh, really good experience. And then, so you'd uh, be a mechanic if you weren't in whiskey. That's I never knew that. That's a good fact. <laughs> well, there was a cross. There was a crossroads, uh, and I remember having to make the choice between going to work for as an apprentice for a Scottish racing team called Acuria Cos. So they were very famous in the 1960s. They won Le Mans with uh, the Jaguars, um, and it was Ooh. massive for a Scottish, um, very amateur team. So I had yeah. the opportunity of doing that, or uh, taking a kind of um, traineeship with Remy Quantro in front. Ah. And, yeah, I chose the latter. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. So did you uh, move over there or were you working based in Scotland then? Yeah, no, I went and lived in Paris for six months. Fantastic. Um, really, really an amazing. And the offices were just, I mean, it was Rome Point de Champs Elysees. You know, oh. it couldn't have been better. Um, I had this massive office. I remember it was absolutely baking. It was in the summer. 
and they didn't have air conditioning because it was a listed building. So I was sort of <laughs> sweltering at my desk. Um, but I got to, you know, it was really interesting in terms of um, groundwork, I suppose. I got to spend a month with each of the um, kind of um, area sales guys and marketing yeah. guys. So I started off with the French guy, then I went to the South American guy, and then the Central European guy, and just went literally around the world without leaving the office. Um, oh, wow. But, but getting a really good understanding of all the different markets and how they operated. Um, and it was still quite dangerous to travel in those days. I mean, it was, you know, this is kind of early what day? Uh, Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, not that long ago. Yeah. And uh, um, I remember the South, the South American guy, uh, um, giving me a project and then going off to market literally and the next thing we knew he'd been mugged and his passport had been stolen and he couldn't get out of wherever he was Bogota or somewhere um, for weeks I mean he literally was he was almost like a kidnapped <laughs> like. employee but no, it, was, it was great I loved every minute of it and and that's kind of what got me hooked on on um, not just alcohol but uh, yeah. but luxury brands you know really really interesting high quality brands Interesting. That's really, I mean, so you were there as an intern. Was that just six months and then you moved on from there or were you, did you end up staying for a bit? So from memory, there was a weird employment law at the time uh, for okay. foreign, foreign stagiaire. Um, I think I could only work for four months and then... That's what's coming uh, back now after Brexit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. And I kind of stayed on for two months just doing kind of, not voluntary, but yeah, just getting a bit yeah. more experience. Okay. Oh my goodness. So that would have been quite, so you would have been quite young then in your early twenties? Uh, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> what a baptism of fire, like being in Paris. I've driven around the uh, Arc de Triomphe and that's, yeah. <laughs> I just closed my eyes and went. It's quite exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. I was an au pair in France, in fact, 94. So we might have been, oh, well, we, yeah. Where, whereabouts? In, um, San, uh, in a banlieue in a suburb north of Paris called, um, uh, oh, it's just escaped my mind, Saint Germain. So, oh, yeah. uh, near a big casino, it's quite a nice area. And we used to take the area, but uh, the area B coming into town. Right. I know Paris very well. <laughs> yeah, it's, good. it's good fun. I always I always loved living there. What an adventure. And the, the Greek quartiers were beautiful with the food yeah. and they were so cheap yeah. as well because I was on a budget. I, I, no, I remember. And I was really lucky because my sister, um, she was actually married to a Frenchman living there at the time. Uh, she'd been there for like 15 years before that. Um, and so it was great. You know, she used to take me out and show me around and, and oh, nice. all the best places. Yeah, yeah, it helps. Oh, brilliant. So are you fluent in French? Uh, non. Google <laughs> 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 What was uh, that? I think once upon a time, maybe I could have been slightly, um, yeah, I could hold a conversation. I mean, sometimes, you know, when you're on holiday and you've had a couple of glasses or something. Oh, yeah. Fluent. Some, uh, something that smells of aniseed. Um, then, uh, yeah, it starts to get a bit more fluent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, great. And did you, uh, something else, did you then go back to Scotland and settle in Scotland or did you have another adventure? No, you settled. Yeah, back. and I came back uh, trying to get into the whiskey industry. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, I suppose it was just as they, it was coming out of the last um, sort of, um, uh, you know, um, not so good period. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think, I would imagine most companies were concentrating on ramping up production, not particularly looking for sales or marketing. Um, I tried and failed to get a job at Glenmorangie oh, uh, uh, and eventually ended up with uh, an amazing, well, basically been mentored by this amazing guy um, who was at the time uh, chief exec or whatever, actually probably chairman of Allied Distillers, oh. um, uh, Andrew Dewar-Jury. And he said, look, just get into the industry however you can and, and, you know, and progress that way. So I ended up sort of slightly um, going sideways uh, and getting a job with Justrini and Brooks uh, J and B, as they're known, oh, yes, so, yeah. famous for their whiskey, but also originally for their wine. Yeah, oh. um, and I went in on the wine side uh, in Edinburgh. Okay. Um, they had a lovely shop on George Street, which is no longer sadly. Uh, but they they were also very big in kind of hospital, uh, hospital hotels and restaurants and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So 
I ended up working the west coast of Scotland for them, doing the, all the oh. hotel and stuff. Um, and that was great, great experience, lovely place to work. Yeah. Um, and then things moved on. A few of us started our own wine company uh, in Edinburgh. Oh. Um, and just by chance, about two years into that, I decided to open a retail shop um, for that and was looking to stock it with things other than just wine and went to my old friend, Jamie Walker, who owned Adelphi, to mm -hmm. ask for some very fine whiskey. Um, and it happened to be the day after he'd sold the business to, oh. uh, to Keith Faulkner and Donald Houston, who, who <laughs> own it now. Um, so I ended up sitting in Keith's garden in Barnton in Edinburgh, uh, asking for a list of whiskies and basically being told that I should come and work for him. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it happened. Yeah, it was literally, they gave me, a, they gave me two days to make up my mind. <laughs> And, um, and he, you know, I had to go and meet Donald as well, uh, up in Arden uh, you know, just yeah, to make sure. Yeah, he lives there. Yeah, oh, yeah. The and, uh, yeah, coming down the road through Glencoe, Keith rang me up and said, right, the job's yours, but we need to know tomorrow. <laughs> um, I love stories like that. That's the best way. Like, great. in the garden, just agree that that's what you're starting. So you, your dream of opening up wine store or spirit store, um, might still happen, but not. <laughs> Well, actually, it, it, it kind of went full circle because um, the guy who I had set the business up with, the wine, you know, the wine team, he's French, a great, a, a oh. long, long-standing friend, godfather to my elders. And um, he then uh, came back and approached us as a Delphi a couple of years later because the company that we'd started was actually a franchise of a London-based company. Okay. Uh, so we had autonomy, but we didn't, you know, we couldn't control the wines we were buying and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, he came, he came back and said, would Adelphi be interested in basically investing, short-term investment in him to start his own wine business from scratch? Um, and uh, so that business is, is still flourishing. It's called uh, L'Art La du Vin. Um, and we actually shared a warehouse with him up until last year. Uh, yeah. so the, oh. the Adelphi and, and the wine business together. Oh, uh, that's lovely. I love how that track is just that you hand by hand, like you've been following each other. Yeah. So up until last year, you were sharing a warehouse. We basically said that we'll do, do the warehouse for 10 years. We built it in 2010 so that we could do our own bottling and stuff. And uh, we said we'll do it for 10 years, by which stage, hopefully, both of us will be too big. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it kind of got to that stage. We could, we there was no room left. Um, hmm. So they've moved to their own, their own place. Oh, wow. You're still friendly, though. We are. <laughs> <laughs> as, as, it's important to have friends in wine, I find. <laughs> very, very important. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I had no idea. So you start then with Adelphi and you say three casks. Like, what do you do? Please, sir, can I have some more? <laughs> well, how does that work? How do, yeah. you, how do you do forecasting for that? <laughs> yeah. Well, we had... I remember we having an amazing lunch, actually, at... Um, because those are the days where you can still do decent business over a lunch. Um, for I was just thinking that. <laughs> and we, we, we went round to see um, uh, P Peter and uh, Leonard Russell at um, Ian McLeod's yeah. uh, and had a very long lunch and walked out having, you know, flexed the checkbook, but walked out <laughs> with a sherry butt of Springbank from 1969. Um, I think a 15-year-old Kulila and a 17-year-old Tandu. Um, and, just, uh, wish. <laughs> <laughs> just things they had lying around, you know, uh, those, those are the days. I was actually, oh. we were just, um, Connell and I this afternoon, we're going through our new list, which is coming out next month and putting the prices on it. And we were going back, I mean, my spreadsheet goes back to probably 2005. Uh -huh. I'm looking at what you could buy, you know, I mean, there was, I think there was a 91 Rosebank. We paid three and a half thousand pounds for the cask, <laughs> the whole cask. You'd be lucky to get a bottle for that now. <laughs> I know. That is, that just shows you how fast things move and yeah. and people that just, but it's good because it's meant to be drunk. It's meant to be sold and, and appreciated, I think. So Absolutely. you do that though. You, do, you buy the casks and bottle them. You don't, do you store them for a long time as well or you don't really mature them much now? I mean, as we've grown and especially with the warehouse, we might uh, buy larger parcels and if there's repetition, just naturally feed it in, you know, bottle it, um, keep the other three or four or whatever and feed yeah. them back. But even that, to be honest, now 
that the markets have grown and we're in you know a lot more uh, countries than we were before we end up having there's no way you can share one cask in in whatever it is 25 markets so we yeah. end up doubling up and we'll, we'll you know we'll we'll share one with europe and one with australasia and, and whatever so even parcels don't last long now no i don't i've never been um working on the side of um whiskey brokerage or buying parcels or i was at weems but it was somebody else that was yeah. responsible for buying any casks but um i understand that in the last few years it's changed enormously it really cha changed because there's so many obviously independent bottlers out there now as well yeah. and yeah. the whiskey has been a bit sparse from a certain era uh, that you now pay for samples i mean that would have not happened back in the day you would have just been given a 70 cl i imagine these days it's like well the health and safety the staff have to go up and get the samples and you know you, you, you just it, it you, you have to pay for it so it's yeah. changed i assume yeah not always but sometimes yeah depending on the supplier I mean, I remember, uh, whoa, what would it be, back, back 2006, um, I was stumbling around in the dark in a warehouse, not ours, someone else's, um, regaging casks that we just bought from that particular supplier. So very mm -hmm. much third party warehouse, you know, I was there in it being, yeah. being loose on my own. And as I was stumbling around, I tripped over a bunch of, you know, amazing casks from, from distilleries that we're not allowed to name, uh, mm -hmm. should we put it? And I went, I went back to um, the office afterwards and I emailed the supplier and said, any chance we could buy some of these casks and, and listed them and straight back, no. <laughs> and he said, look, the reason I can't sell them is we're, we're, we're contracted as, as you know, many people are, that um, they're for blending, they're not for single malt. You can't use the brand name, whatever. So I came up with the idea of, of uh, a kind of um, generic brand called Breath of Angels. And we just oh. we just named it Breath of uh, the region it came from, and oh. that way we could buy these secret casks, uh, and and no no one got into any trouble. <laughs> okay, amazing. So you just had to think on your feet, and you got there. Yeah, That's well, great. Yeah. Whiskey's you know getting decent whiskey is always good, so you've got to just work out a way of getting it. <laughs> that is, I I'd never heard of that. I must look at that. That's great. I um, there's a few questions actually. I'll just because uh, they might still be on. Somebody was asking about the most amazing Colila sherry that's just gone, and they said, "Is there any more coming soon?" <laughs> um, not from that absolutely specific batch. I think there were five from that batch okay. uh, in total, but there is more. There are more coming um, from a different vintage potentially. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, we've been really lucky with with well Colila. Um, liquid in, in some decent, pretty decent cherry cask. I've got this. This is a bit of um, um, product research going on here. Uh, this is You're coming working out. tonight. <laughs> this is coming out in July. Uh, this is a 13 year old Blair Raffle. Oh, oh my. Um, mm. Pretty decent colour. So, that yeah, is um, uh, more Kulila will be coming um, probably in about three months, four months, hopefully. And somebody else, I'm terribly bad at remembering who asked what, but if you're still listening, there was somebody asking about your maturation. Do you fully mature in sherry casks? So obviously you buy a cask in, do you then move, would you move it to sherry casks and keep it in sherry? Very good question. We, as, as a sort of um, ethos, we don't finish. Um, or we, we've, we've, we've never really seen the reason to finish because we're buying um, what we like uh, as in, when we buy it, the flavour is, is to our palate, therefore it doesn't need to be changed. Having no. said that, um, over the last couple of years, we've, we've sort of progressed the whole uh, maturation. We've got the room now, well, at least we did <laughs> until we filled it up. <laughs> we've got more room than we did. Um, we're able to buy larger parcels. Uh -huh. We tend to buy the larger parcels blind and then do our selection once we own them. So, so you do them blind, okay. Having done that, we then have obviously the choice of, yes, it's great, so let's, let's just bottle it now. Or, yes, it will be great in maybe 18 months' time, so we'll just shove it to the back of the warehouse. Or, yes, it's great, but um, maybe the cask could be re-racked into the same type, but a little bit fresher. And it's that last method that is a bit of a win-win, because when I'm buying the uh, sherry cask for Ardnamurkin, um, I don't want them all to be first filled. No. 
because I want to spread the portfolio going forward of, of how things mature and how long they yeah. take and, and the style, if you like. So we can use some, some of those fresh. We basically kidnapped, we, we intercept the Spanish lorry as it's heading north <laughs> and we, we steal some of the Arden Mercancasts and we oh. use them to re-rack some of the lesser sherry or the ones that haven't come on enough. Um, yeah. and when they've done their re-rack after a few months, we shove them up the road as refills. Ah, okay. Reckon. But it, it's still... Proper Scottish, uh, not losing anything. Yeah. <laughs> We're using it all. <laughs> but even, even within all that, uh, we still want to keep the profile of the original whiskey the same. So we're not going to change it from bourbon to wine or, you know, we're no. not going to go to those, those, um, uh, it's not really our thing. If you, if you know. No, you're just giving it a little extra boost with yeah. a fresher yeah. cast. Absolutely. That makes sense. That's nice. It keeps it true to what it was in the beginning as well. Brilliant. Uh, another question was, how do we find your bottlings in the USA, in America? <laughs> That's a bit of a sore point. Um, there's a lot of things happening. The easiest way to explain it is for the last two or three years, we've had so much demand elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And because the US, as you'll, you'll be very aware, is a different bottle, it's a different label, there's a whole different process of getting it there with yeah. FDA registration, um, all this kind of stuff. We tend to take the easy route yeah. and sell where it's easy, basically. Having said all that, uh, the US has and I hope will re um, regain its number one position in, yeah. in terms of our markets. It has been number one. Um, uh, and there are a number of things which have obviously happened in the last year or so with the current um, leadership and uh, <laughs> various other things, which is making Scotch whiskey harder to sell in the US. So um, long story short, we will be back. Uh, they're just a temporary blip. Um, okay. All right. I wasn't even aware there was a blip, but there you go. Yeah, there there uh, is still some stock floating around, uh, limited amount, but it's from about two years ago. Um, yeah. Great. Oh, well, <laughs> um, you, it, I, I can't, this is probably going to be a two hour chat. <laughs> <laughs> that was just like the first like scratch on top. Okay. Now there's so that, much more. That egg is going to be hard boiled. <laughs> yes, it is. You might <laughs> Who can come first, chicken or egg? Um, you've mentioned uh, Arden American. So um, it's, it makes sense for an independent bottler that needs more product to build its own distillery. And mm -hmm. you took that step. Um, when did you decide that that was going to be, that when that was going to happen? Uh, 2007. Okay. Um, I remember... I mean, the uh, board meetings in those days, I mean, they were, they were proper meetings, but they were very much, um, well, 90% of them was talking about the local fishing and the weather and, you know, that kind of stuff. Quite often out on locks in a, in a boat, literally. Oh. Um, but they, they had very serious elements to them because the, the business was expanding quite rapidly. And I remember there was a meeting in 2007 uh, and I put my hands up and I said, look, I don't know what to do. You, you employed me as sales director. I'm selling everything we can get, but we can't get enough. So we're literally, we're going to flatline. Um, um, and they said, well, what do you want? You know, what, what should we do? And I said, well, it's probably, probably three choices we could look at. Uh, one is we could become uh, a larger independent bottler and start laying down stock, you know, from, from scratch, uh, uh, filling and all the rest of it. Second one is we could go out and try and find a distillery uh, to buy. Um, and just take it on. And the third one is, you know, we could actually get out there and, and build our own. And um, there was a bit of discussion and we decided to pursue the third option. But, I mean, I, I remember that it must have been two or three years of back and forth with architects and, and getting seriously scared off by the price of, you know, the cost of doing it. Not just to build, but what happens after that. Yeah. Um, and I was continuing my day job. I was still traveling, doing whiskey fairs and all the rest of it. And one of, well, there were two things that happened, but one in particular, um, I was lucky enough to join Anthony Wills on a trip to, we were in Tokyo. I think you might've been there actually. That, I think I might've been, yes. <laughs> it, it, was the, it was the trip when you guys went to the fish market at five o'clock in the morning. Oh, um, yes, and I didn't, yes. I remember. <laughs> but anyway, Anthony and I popped up to Chichibu to see Ichiro because obviously oh. their two distilleries, Kilhoman and, and Chichibu, 
but very much alive. I remember that, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, started. and I was absolutely blown away by what, by, you know, what he'd created there. Yeah. The quality, um, the simplicity, as in, you know, right down to the mash tun still being stirred by, I, don't, I can't remember if Yui was there at the time, or, but there's very much an awe, um, you know, all stirred. And so I came back full of kind of beans and, and reported back to the board that we don't have to put this monstrosity of a, a warehouse, a, a distillery into our market. We can actually go, not craft, but we can go much more uh, small scale. Yeah. Um, so we, we reduced the whole thing with the footprint and everything like that. And then gradually built it back to a place where we think, thought it would be most economically viable. Um, right. So that, that was probably about 2011 uh, mm -hmm. when we finally accepted a, an architect tender. Um, we went for planning permission and then all kinds of things happened, you know, the, um, yeah, can of worms. <laughs> well, funny you should say, so you decided on Agna Merkin. Is that because of the connection that your, already, your leader, uh, like the management already have over there? So you, you thought that would be a good place? That was the opportunity. Uh, so yeah. both owners um, had properties there. Brilliant. Uh, one um, uh, owns and runs the uh, Agna Merkin estate, so the farming. Mm. Uh, everything else goes along with it. Uh, so the opportunity was that we had the ability to build, there were six different sites from memory that we looked at um, uh, in and around the peninsula. But the more we thought about it, it wasn't just the opportunity of building there, it was the sort of symbiotic relationship that we could then have with that land and, and um, farming and all the rest of it that made so much sense. Um, you know, we could work together, we could work for each other, uh, and, and the combination of both was great for the, this kind of circular economy in, that, in, the, in a very remote area. Yeah, because you would be relying a lot on your neighbours and you need to have like a, quite a good relationship with people over there and, and so yeah. keep it local, that makes sense. And I Absolutely. think you've managed to do that really well. You, you're, you're green, you're one of the greenest distilleries in Scotland, I think, if not the greenest. And, and it's all done. It's all done for a reason. It's not just because we want to be green or, or you know, tick no. that box. It's done because we have that opportunity. So there is no point when you're an hour and a half down a single track road trying to bring, bring in a lorry full of diesel or oil to, you know, to fill up your boiler twice a week. No. Or it just doesn't make sense. Apart from anything else, the, the infrastructure it yeah. makes it impossible. Um, so you look for a local source of, of fuel and we have all this amazing forestry a renewable forestry, it, it costs more than it's worth to take it off the peninsula for timber. Um, so you, you might as well try and use it locally. So when, when someone comes along and puts in a boiler at the size of the uh, American one, uh, which requires about a ton every two hours of wood chip, um, you, you suddenly have a, a source and uh, demand. Is there enough uh, forestry to cover that? Yeah. So, I mean, as they work through all the, all the standing timber, they're obviously replanting um, yeah. and it's continual. And, you know, that pine, the softwood, traditional Scottish softwood, it, it, it will grow within 10, 15 years into um, mm. something which you can then harvest for wood chip. Fantastic. That is, I forgot that. that. That's how you do it. I, I, great. And it is really right. good to see. I mean, your tractor and trailer pitches up, tips its load of wood chip. The trailer then sits there takes the draft, you know, the tractor comes back a few hours later, pulls the draft out, um, takes it back to where the wood chip was produced two miles away. Meanwhile, we now have pipes taking all our liquid byproduct over the hill to the same place. So it's about two miles of pipe work. Oh. Um, that then gets evaporated and uh, combined with the draft. So the syrup and the draft combined and then pelletized and then fed straight uh, to the animals. Oh. So it, it's even really richer. Good. Really, really good combination. And it's all, every production plant is all fueled by the wood chip. Huh. Uh, so, and do you mature everything on site or do you tra do you have to transfer some of the spirits over to, I was no. going to say the mainland, you're not on an island, but you're pretty much out. <laughs> well, sometimes <laughs> are, the not working, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, it's very much part of what we want is, is the, um, I don't like using the word terroir, but it's the Scottish version of it. Um, yeah. and Mac Terror. <laughs> Mac Terror. Well, actually, funnily enough, uh, uh, this is another tangent, but we can spend an hour on. 
uh, Dave Brim was writing an article when we were out in New Zealand just before lockdown. And he said, oh. do you mind contributing to my article I'm writing on, on tapawire and whiskey? Uh, oh God, here we go. Um, and I was doing, I didn't do very much research because I just basically told our story and, and what it, you know, what it means to us, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, but I, the only research I did was I looked back at, uh, in sort of old Scottish text to see if terroir is mentioned in farming or anything at all. And there's a, a mention, I can't remember where I found it, 200 years ago or something. And it's literally, it's a translation of the word terroir in Scots to terror. <laughs> and it, summed, it just summed it up, the whole thing, the terror of the land, you know, the, the, the unpredictable weather, the, yeah. all these kind of things, you know. Um, so I thought that was great. So I just basically wrote to Dave and said, yeah, it's terror, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, look, maturation on site was incredibly important to us. Uh, we've got this amazing, you know, soft, cool breeze coming in. Well, breeze, storm, force wind <laughs> <laughs> coming off the Atlantic. Um, we're right there. Lots of salt spray. Um, we had a tiny blip oh, a couple of years ago when Highland Council was a wee bit slow granting planning permission for more warehouses. Oh. Um, so, and we didn't want to stop production. So we, we temporarily moved a few off site. Um, but they're all back. There. So there's there's nine and a half thousand cars sitting there. Maturing. Oh wow! Um, spread I mean, where do you have? Uh, so we're on to we're just when we come off lockdown, we're just starting to fill uh, <laughs> warehouse four. But okay. warehouse one is actually on two levels, so oh. it, it's the fifth sort of level, if you like. Yeah, yeah. We, we've got to, and there's there's planning gone in for another two. Uh, and we kind of hope that will be it. Um, and, okay. That assumes we can sell it, though, of course. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you will be able to. And, and there's space for it, I take it, because obviously there's lots of space over there. Uh, it's quite neat, though. I mean, you, I don't know if you've seen the aerial photo looking down. Oh, yeah, I have. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah. It's all quite compact. Um, yeah. It's not too spread out. Uh, and it kind of fits in with the area nicely. Oh, no, it looks great. I, I, I'm ashamed to say I still haven't been. I Every time I see you, I think you've fed up me saying, I have to go. I will go. I am going, and I never. Um, with, uh, we were having a Zoom class today with my my six year old, and his teacher said that her favourite campsite is in Arnamarkin. So uh, yeah, uh, I don't know what it was called, but I don't. Well, actually, might be. there's two. The, the the big ones at uh, Resipol. Um, yes, that one. That one. Yeah, which is about. It's not quite as far along as us. Um, okay. We're about another twenty minutes from there. Half an hour. Well, uh, considering it's lockdown, it looks like we're going to be uh, doing a staycation this year. So I think if, well, mind you, I think they might be closed for the whole summer. Who knows? We don't know. Like, that's it. We'll have to might see. Might be camping in our garden. Who knows? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, this is it. Uh, so our number uh, was finished. When was the, the, when was the first time you, you ran Spirit that you were happy with on the stills? How many, was that six years ago exactly, or is it? Almost exactly yeah. six years ago, yeah. We were trialing in, in June. In yeah. Um, and then the official opening was at the end of July. And uh -huh. we filled the first cask, I think, it's either the 1st or the 2nd of August. Uh, okay. Um, ah, okay. So you're really close to having that six-year-old anniversary yeah. then. Yeah. And did you ever... Um, you have, a, you have released some products, and I love your packaging. That bottle is stunning. It's beautiful. I don't know whose idea that one. Yeah. The AD, yeah. I mean, that literally was, was scribbled on the back of a, well, we used to say back of a fag packet. I don't think that's quite sort of legitimate anymore. But, um, <laughs> <I get> the... <laughs> <laughs> but it was lot, lots of ideas kind of swimming around. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, what is the natural color of Ardna Merck and, uh, or what is it famous for? Yeah. Uh, famous for its volcanic rock. I mean, it was one, if you drive right to the end of our American, you, you come into this, you don't actually realize when you're on the road, you, you, you'd be better in a helicopter or something, but <laughs> the whole kind of atmosphere changes. You come into this huge, great open bowl, which was a massive dormant or extinct crater, uh -huh. volcanic wow. crater. Um, and, you know, centuries ago, it literally was, there was lava spewing out all over the place. So we've got this beautiful wash up on the beaches and everywhere. This beautiful kind of slate gray, um, slate blue gray colored stone. So that was that we homed in on that as our kind of yeah. color, and we really wanted to show it. But then, of course, the problem was Adelphi's always been about, you know, minimal, minimalist labeling. 
so you can mm -hmm. see that kind of natural color in the bottle. Yeah. Um, so how, how did we, you know, coat the bottle in, in color and yet still see that whiskey? So yeah. it came up with the idea of a window and that was what the hydrometer, you know, so you could see through. Um, and then the whole provenance traceability bit, writing all the, 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 oh. the headlines. And the, the copper is so contrasting as well, that like you've got the copper uh, wrap on it, it's beautiful. No, it's very, like, so you did that yourself. That's brilliant. Well, look, I, I literally scribbled something down. I'm no artist at all, but I scribbled down my mm. ideas, gave it to our designers in, in Edinburgh. Yeah. Who, who did, I mean, the great thing is, uh, Nevis Design, they, they were right back at the beginning with Jamie Walker and Charlie McLean. They were on the scene. Uh, uh, be it in the different guys, but the guy who runs yeah. it was, was there. So he knows, he's seen the whole evolution of, of from, from Jamie's independent bottle all the way through. So okay. I don't really have to work that hard. I just chuck in some ideas and, and, and the, fact, the brand remains as it is, you know, it just yeah. evolves, um, which is fantastic. But it was Absolutely. great for them because I mean, he did, he did the artwork, we got the bottle made and it's quite a difficult process. I mean, it's like four different coatings, so it wasn't cheap. Oh, really? Um, with the, um, with but, the it's got it's quite tactile you can feel it all it's quite yeah. Uh, yeah um but it went on to win the the design the scottish design awards which is fantastic so yeah, yeah from, from back of fag packet to that it was a <laughs> <laughs> it, it, well exactly but it's well worth it and, and that's how the best ideas come about I, know. I like that you're combining that slate uh, sorry the volcanic um the volcanic stone Volcanic stone. I didn't even know about that. So that's that's cool. And the copper contrasts beautifully against that blue great grey that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, I, no, I mean, the, the peninsula is, in a, is a geologist's sort of mecca. People come from all yeah. over the world to, to go and look at rocks in Arden America. Oh, really? I mean, it's, it's part of that part of Scotland, which used to belong to, I suppose, Canada or North America. Um, yeah. And gradually drifted across and, and joined Europe. Um, okay, I hear you. <laughs> so it's very different from the rest of Europe. But, um, I've never been, but my partner had sailed a bit in the West Coast when we lived in Cameltown, and he, he's been on this sort of coast of there, and he says it's stunning, it's beautiful. So definitely, definitely coming to visit. <laughs> very welcome. <laughs> um, so you you were distilling then six years ago. Were you ever thinking about doing gin? No. That's <laughs> <laughs> the short answer to that. Um, uh, we, 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 I think probably the, the, the correct answer is twice. Um, okay. Not quite at the outset, but shortly after there was rumblings of Scottish gin and stuff like that. Yeah. So we went back to, I think we went back to Versailles and just said, what if, you know, what do we need to do? Yeah. And, and then something else happened, I think, and we kind of, we didn't bother following up on it. And then more recently, about probably two years ago, we were looking at potentially bringing on um, uh, another partner, more equity in the business, that kind of stuff, another shareholder. And they were very keen that if they came on, we should do gin. Okay. So we did a bit more research at that point. Yeah. And the answer was still no. <laughs> um, but I love... I That's love, your uh, years. <laughs> I, I do love gin. Um, and I take my hat off to those who've done it and done it well. Yeah. Um, it's something we, as an industry, we should be incredibly proud of what's happened in yeah. recent in Scotland. I had the rather um, uh, nerve wracking uh, experience over the last couple of years of chairing the Scottish Gin Awards. Because oh, I, think, I didn't realise. Well, because we think, well, well, probably because I'm one of the only just, you know, people who's involved in the whiskey industry that doesn't do gin. <laughs> <laughs> I can still be reasonably objective. Yeah. But, you know, when I, when I, so part of the um, remit for that was to stand up and do the kind of welcome speech at the awards dinner in Glasgow. Uh -huh. And the first time I did it, there were about 400 people in the room. That was bad enough. And the last year when I did it, it was a packed, uh, I think it was in Hilton, absolutely packed out at 800 people or just over 800. And it's just, I mean, it's so scary. But um, I mean, all, all credit to, I mean, it's um, yeah, amazing to see what's been going on. Yeah, I, I agree. I, so I do a little bit of whiskey tasting in Swedish here in Edinburgh and also in Sweden when I'm home. But uh, gin has become so popular in, in the summer when I've been in Sweden. I've done a couple of Scottish gin tastings. Ah. So tonight, somebody asked me if I was drinking water with watermelon. Uh, I'm drinking the pink gin from Hollywood Distillery in Edinburgh. Oh, wow. Um, and I didn't have uh, any fresh lemons, but we had some lem melon. 
spelled the same way almost <laughs> <laughs> well after your second gen it's spelled the same way definitely <laughs> So I thought, look, that looks pretty. And actually, it's tasted amazing. So the pink Hollywood gin works really well with watermelon. I don't even know if they've tried that themselves. But um, it's a hibiscus flavoured, I think. It's beautiful, really nice, nice, easy to drink. So it's finished. <laughs> um, yeah, I, do, I, like, I like a gin and tonic. I like a whiskey as well. Um, so you, you've obviously been involved then in the independent bottling for Adelphi. They are an American distillery, uh, Seto. And um, there's, there's something popped up when I was Googling you that was a fusion whiskey. Hmm. What was, that, was, that, that was something I hadn't actually even heard about. So that sounds great though. That was another kind of spare of the moment idea. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it was 2015, pretty sure it was. Uh, three, three gentlemen, uh, who I know very well now, uh, pitched up in the office down here. And they said, look, we've been recommended to come to you. We want to do a small batch uh, Scottish blend, you know, blended Scotch whiskey, uh -huh. to commemorate the life of someone called Thomas Blake Glover. And I said, who was Glover? So they launched into this great story about how he uh, uh, was born in Fraserburgh, uh, pretty much got shipped out to the Far East when he was 16 years old, 17 years old, and landed in Japan just after the Treaty of Amity and Commerce was signed. Um, in 1858, I think, um, and suddenly realized, you know, he was sitting on a potential gold mine in terms of uh, trade between the West and the East. So he was very, he was very clever, I mean, for, considering he was only about 18 years old. The first thing he did was he um, kind of scouted out, bear in mind, Japan is still a very kind of feudal system and very much warlord, you know, tribal, if you like. Yeah. Uh, but he scouted out the most influential people and he brought back, I think, four or five of them to um, the UK. You got a visitor. Somebody must have been watching my comment about running out of gym. <laughs> Thank you. I don't get that service. That's terrible. You should try it. Try it. I didn't even know he was watching. <laughs> Brilliant. He's a keeper. Uh, no, so, yeah. Um, yeah, he, he, he brought back these, these influential people to the UK. They learned about the West. They had a bit of education in so university level. They then went back straight into power and they took him with them. So mm -hmm. he had literally uh, an open book to play with. And he ended up being incredibly influential in terms of industrialization. So railroads, uh, shipbuilding. I uh, mean, he founded companies like uh, Mitsubishi. Um, that was one of his. Uh, Kieran Brewery, that was another one. So, so yeah, he's incredibly famous over there. I mean, he's still, his, his life is still part of the educational curriculum. Okay. Uh, and something like 4 million visitors to his house every year what? in uh, Nagasaki. But the problem was, back in Scotland, no one, including me at that point, had ever heard of him. So, and they were trying to raise money to uh, resurrect or rebuild his house in Aberdeenshire. Oh. And also um, bring a bit more sort of diverse tourism to the northeast of Scotland. Mm -hmm. So they were looking at different Scottish brand or different Scottish um, commodities that could help do that. Hence asking us to blend a Scotch whiskey. So I ran through a few basics with them. And then I said, well, you know, given his story, why don't we go out and try and blend uh, Scotch with Japanese? Because that's what he did. Yeah. So they, they, it was a pretty stupid thing to say because it then involved all kinds of discussions with the SWA and various other people to try and work out how to do it. And it, yeah. it wasn't, it, you know, even right to the end, it wasn't plain sailing. No. I mean, things like, for example, you know, we'd, we'd secured amazingly off a chiro, uh, a, a hogshead, I think it was, of 22-year-old um, Hanyu as the Japanese oh. um, um, entity, if you like. Um, and we knew that we had to blend it outside of Scotland because you can only produce Scotch whiskey in Scotland. Okay. Um, so we'd worked out this way of taking it to England and, and blending it and then bringing it back to bottle here and all that kind of stuff. But just as we were about to do that trip, the first ever trip, so the hand you were sitting down at St. George's Distillery in Norfolk, ready for us, uh, we had matched it beautifully with a, a similar age Longmorn from a, an American Oak Sherry hogshead. Oh. That was sitting in an IBC because, of course, you can't take um, whiskey out in cask or single malt. And then the HMRC verification thing came in, you know, for our GI status. That literally came in that week. 
So we all had our visits and our inspections. And the first thing they said, what's that tank? You know, and I said, oh, it's fine, don't worry. It's a, it's a long one and it's not for scotch. We're taking it down south to, um, to blend it. You know, it's, it's no problem. And they said, well, you're not allowed to do that anymore. You can only take- Oh, they just changed. Yeah, yeah. You can only take single malt out of Scotland in a bottle fully labeled and packaged for sale. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh no. Because you know, it was, it was incredibly quick, the whole process. I mean, from the concept in I think January or February, we were now yeah. August, September. So all the packaging, everything had been done at that time. Mm. And it was this kind of dun. <laughs> yeah. Nope. So, and then I, I literally went and cried in my seat uh, back oh. in, uh, in, in um, the office and, and then thought, well, hang on. GI status is only covering single malt Scotch whiskey. So if it's blended, scotch whiskey or blended malt it's not covered so i went back and i checked hmrc was still on site and i uh -huh. said if that happened to be a blended malt could we take it out i said yeah yeah, oh. no worries that's not part of our remit at all so we we literally dropped a couple of bottles of um i think it was mccallan or glen elgin or something into it it was mccallan um and off it went you're and a genius I, uh, thank you on your feet it was great fun um but it started this kind of roller coaster because we did that we did a simultaneous launch in Tokyo and Aberdeen. So oh. I, I was in Tokyo with a couple of other guys in um, the Helmsdale, six o'clock, enjoying the Glover. And these poor guys were back here, Charlie McLean and a few other people were in the Maritime Museum in Aberdeen at nine o'clock in the morning. I mean, it, it was fine for Charlie, but the others. Like, well, yeah, I was going to say, that's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it started a roller coaster. By the time I'd got to Australia, because I was doing a kind of long trip, it had all sold out. Um, oh. we'd, done, we'd done two batches and it wasn't cheap. I mean, the, the original, in fact, I've got a bottle. <laughs> See me? But a brilliant story and a nice uh, reason for it to come around. Oh, wow. That the, the oh, that's one. proper Japanese style. Um, so that, I, I think that retailed at about £1,100. Um, but considering what was in it, including the hand you, it wasn't, wasn't that bad a deal. Anyway, no. that, that sold out, sold out on ballot, um, on, uh, which was great. And then, um, yeah, the, the, the guys who had called themselves Thomas Blake Glover, Glover Company or whatever, Limited, mm -hmm. then thought, well, hang on a second. And they changed their name to Fusion Whiskey Limited. And we started doing it with other countries. Um, so the, the concept is basically a Scot who has been incredibly influential in another country. Okay. Not necessarily famous back here. In fact, better if he's not. Yeah. Uh, and we blend, we find a, a, a suitable distillery who we, we can um, um, share whiskey with, if you like. And mm -hmm. we blend with them. So we've, we've worked with Amrit in India, with Starwood in Australia, um, Zydam in Holland. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's been great. Oh, amazing. Really good fun. Yeah, I'd never heard of Fusion Whiskey and I was embarrassed. I mean, I was out, I was on maternity leave for quite a few years, so I, yeah. I would have been in that. <laughs> uh, but then, yeah, because I was looking you up, and then it, I think it was a Starboard Australian uh, launch that popped up, and then I right. came over, I came across the Glover story, a Glover story, and uh, what a great story. That's what whiskey is all about. I mean, we love the biology behind it, and we love the simplicity and the, and the history, but those stories by the people, the Scottish people, they're Absolutely. great. And, you know, I'm not sure that, um, I'll put my hands up and say I'm not sure that everyone in the industry back here was 100% enamoured with what we did because it's it's not that it's selling scotch down the you know you know taking it away from from Scotland it, it was it was never that idea the idea was a to promote Scots and what Scotland has done for the rest of the world in the nice yeah. way but from a from a whiskey point of view we uh, the Scotch whiskey industry has been so influential about blending, um, mm -hmm. albeit amongst ourselves, but proving that a, a, a large industry can work together by keeping these friendships, these blending friendships alive. It's so yeah. important for an industry like ours. So all, all we're kind of doing is just bringing that into a more international spectrum. Um, yeah, bringing the The long-term goal, and we just, um, just literally launched the first one. Long-term goal was to start using our Demerkin as the Scotch base for these um, these fusions. And we've just launched the fifth Glover with uh, Chichibu. So it's an Arden American Chichibu, um, uh, which has been great. It's been really, really exciting. 
Um, and is uh, that already out or? <laughs> oh, oh, just uh, put a stamp of... on that and, and my address, please. <laughs> it's is that actually kind of... it there? Well, that, that was the uh, sample. What was that? Oh, no, that was an online tasting we did on Friday night in Holland. Oh. Um, I had to have a sample for it. But look, it's, it's gone. I haven't even got a bottle myself. It's all gone. <laughs> So, just shows you the story is important and and it raises an awareness for for like you said blending but also the, the characters that you're uh, honoring with these whiskies no oh, great it's so exciting as well the, the flavors that you get to work with um oh so yeah it's so it just it's extraordinary because you know i'm not saying it's a better whiskey or a worse whiskey than you could do mm. in Scotland. it's just it broadens the whole spectrum um and i've loved doing it it, it hasn't sometimes it will just goes bang like that and it works mm. straight off but other times you can spend days on trying to get things to match and marry. Um, Means you have had to learn quite a lot about other whiskies as well, not just Scotch. I, I was speaking to Craig Johnson uh, earlier last week, actually, and he was telling me something I didn't realise. In Tasmania, uh, the, the whisky matures in the cask, but it, the strength doesn't change. So it just adds that funny DNA to the whisky. So it, it's 63.5% when they put it in the cask at Lark, and then it's 63.5% that, Three, five, six, yeah, well, that's quite that's a that's a funny anomaly because normally it either goes down like it does here, or it shoots yeah. up in a really hot country, and Tasmania okay. must be that absolute sort of medium, if you like. He said it's something to do with the humidity, but they just don't know what it is yet, and they're playing yeah. with it. And he said they even had like warehouses that are built in different angles, like one corner is in the sun, another one is in the shade. They've talked about it, and they they're looking into it, but. He, me he said that just means that you've got that flavour on Tasmanian whiskey that just comes from <laughs> that not changing the strength, the alcohol strength. So the they have to do it. so important in maturation. What, what's yeah. their evaporation like, do you know? Don't know, sorry. You can say. Um, Craig, if you're watching. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. No, because it's something that we've, I mean, the industry here has looked at, as you know, um, a number of years now is filling at high strength versus the traditional 63 and a half. Yeah, because uh, Billy Walker, uh, he does a high strength. Well, I don't know if he does. I think he does it at Craig Allocate. I'm sure he would. Well, I don't know. I, I've guessed yeah. that. But I know he did it in... Um, well, I mean, Ed Edrington have, have done it for a yeah. long time. Um, well, for, for most of their brands. Um, but it's, yeah, it, it has a different uh, maturation cycle. It, it, yeah. it obviously hits the wood. It's much more, um, much bigger impact from, from day one. So it's a very different style of whiskey. Um, yeah. What yeah. do you do? Do you, do you uh, alternate or do you just do, do you do 63 and a half or do you do? We have done, I would say, probably 95% of the stuff is, not, is at 63 and a half. Okay. Um, when we were temporarily having to offload down to outside warehouses, mm -hmm. uh, purely for economics, you know, to fit more on the lorry, yeah. uh, we filled briefly for about a month at 69.9. Oh, really? For space? So, was that for space issues? issues or? Just, literally to get more casks in one lorry. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you know, the transport costs uh, to and from our American are not cheap. <laughs> exactly. Um, I've managed to do what I knew I was going to do, but I think I've done it with a spectacular delay. I, I have a whole other page of questions for you. Uh, and I want to geek out completely on the technology that you're using on our American and how uh, modern, um, uh, well, the blockchain technology, basically. So I've only got one more minute here. So what I might ask you to do is I would end our conversation and fall back if you're okay with that. I don't want to take up. Absolutely, yeah. So what, I'll just wait for you to go live again and then join in. So I'll end now. And there's a few people actually watching us live, which is lovely. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I will also upload this to YouTube so you can watch it later because I realize I'm, I'm, we've taken a lot of your time. Out. I've loved hearing all about your, your, your yeah. life and with me. And, uh, and the fusion with skin stories are fantastic. So what I'll do is I'll sign off and then uh, you just, same thing again, watch me live and I'll invite you. So okay. we'll see you at the other side. Nice. Bye. Uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> Long time no see. I know. I've seen you in ages and then twice in one day. Oh, it's great. I managed to plug my phone in because it's running out of batteries. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Sorry. It is. It's really bad broadcasting technique. There's uh, just asking people to talk to me and thingy and then never stop oh, talking. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, thanks for coming back. And a few people are actually signing back on again. I, I think they just love hearing from you because um, 
you're just a fountain of knowledge. How do you keep all these like dates of like Glover? You knew you knew everything about him. Um, That's the great thing about doing the ambassador work. You get to talk about it, which is um, you get to bore people all over the world. <laughs> well, it's bore away. Love it. Um, so yeah, we, we've spoken about. Uh, I love how uh, how green. Arden American is, and you're, you're saying, well, it's not because we're wanting to take a box. It just makes sense. It makes logistical sense to mm. do that. I completely appreciate that. Um, but you've gone a bit beyond there because um, you've uh, joined the 21st century completely traditional uh, distillation, but we are uh, now able to track and trace the whiskey through uh, blockchain technology. W what made you, I mean, I know you convinced the owners and the board to build a new distillery. Uh, was it your idea then to go, let's just be different and do it this way? Like, let, let's just add blockchain technology to the story. Did you bring that up? Yeah, um, but it wasn't. I'm just trying to actually remember how it all kicked off. It, um, I do quite a lot of work uh, in the sort of food and drink, you know, sphere, not yeah. just the whiskey, but also for Scotland food and drink. Um, I've been very fortunate to be, be sort of part of that for a few years. And... Um, at one of our meetings, I heard about someone pitching this idea. They'd come through one of the sort of um, accelerated business programs, uh, Entrepreneurial Spark, I think it was, or whatever. Yeah. And the idea was for food traceability um, mm -hmm. using blockchain, which I'd never heard of apart from cryptocurrency. Um, and the, the, what they were pushing for was funding and uh, practical someone to practically take it up, you know, like experience of what they described as pig to pork chop. So basically, um, Mildred, the pig in the field, trace her life all the way, and it sounds rather morbid, but all the way from eating grass and, and scraps and stuff in the field to uh, the consumer picking up a pork chop out of the supermarket uh, fridge or freezer mm -hmm. and being able to scan a label on that pork chop and get to, to relive that whole story. Yeah. So it was all about traceability, uh, transparency to a certain extent, uh, but key for food products and uh, for quality in food was the authenticity. Um, yeah. And that, this was beginning to, well, it already made massive kind of headlines in, in Asia where they were struggling to uh, genuinely see what was authentic and what wasn't, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in when they were shopping for food. So yeah. I listened to this and I, it didn't really click to start with. I thought, oh, that was a great idea, you know. And they yeah. were telling us about all the other things it could do, like, you know, Farmer Giles, who owned Mildred, rather than having to get out of his Land Rover Discovery and put his boots on and go around counting all his sheep, he could literally sit out with, a, with a, an RFID scanner or equivalent outside his <laughs> window and just go around and they'd all ping back in, you know. <laughs> and his pipe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's, uh, the meeting finished and I went home and or back to the office and uh, didn't really think any more about it. And at the same time, I was also looking at, uh, because the Delphi's never really needed a, a stock system. We just work with the basic accounting software and it's fine. And, the, you know, sort of piece of paper. But for yeah. Adam American, you know, when you're starting to lay down stock uh, for the future, you've yeah. got to think about what the system's going to be. And the ones, there's some very well known ones in the industry. Uh, they're all quite expensive. Um, but they're all very good at doing what they do, you know, which is basically stock, looking yeah. after the stock. Um, and then something just kind of went ding like this. I thought, oh, hang on a second, there may be a bit yeah. of you know, synergy here. So I got uh, the contact details for these guys, and I rang them up and said, please come in for a meeting. And they came in, and I, I explained what we were looking for, and, and they said, well, yeah, we could probably do that. Um, so I then started to ask a bit more detailed questions, and one of the first questions I asked was, from what we know about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, blockchain, which is the kind of the network, the, the support behind it, which mm -hmm. allows uh, trust between individuals rather than having to go through a bank or you know, yeah. an institution or a government controlled institution. Um, it, it seems to be doing a great job for this kind of trust and all, all the rest of it. But surely there must be some pitfalls. There must be some loopholes and all the rest of it. What is its biggest downfall? You know? And they said, well, look, the, the great thing about blockchain is once the information is in your node, as in the place where it's stored, uh -huh. you cannot corrupt it. it it's locked in. Um, 
now, if you make a mistake, for example, say I uploaded my name was Bob, um, yeah. I needed to change it to Alex, you would actually, as a punter going in, you would then see in your node that, uh, that Bob had been crossed out and Alex had been replaced. So okay. it, it's it really transparent. Yeah, yeah, it stays that transparent. But they said, look, th there is one issue, um, and that is the information that goes in is only as good and as truthful as a person who's putting it in. Yeah. So in the way the cryptocurrencies work is they have multiple people feeding in to these nodes. And the more people you have feeding in, the more trustworthy it becomes because they're each adding a layer of trust and they each have to believe each other, if you like. Yeah. Um, but the great thing about Scotch whiskey is every time we scratch our nose or you know anything in the process, it's, it's uh, written down, it's, it's passed on to HMRC as part of our weights to measures what we're producing, how much alcohol, you know, how much angels share, all this kind of stuff. It all gets uploaded on our paperwork to HMRC. So we have a natural uh, judge or authenticator. We, the, the bank, if you like, HMRC is the equivalent of a bank. Yeah. They're checking all that information. So it actually makes a lot of sense. You know, we don't need to have masses amount of people in our node. We can have our supply chain. We could, in theory, have the farmer uploads the harvest data. Uh, the cast supplier uploads what, what's happened to the cast beforehand, how they get there and all the rest of it. So all the way through, we have this lovely traceability of supply chain. And then when it gets to the distillery, um, every time you do something like a mill or a mash or a fermentation, add yeast, distillation run, fill a cask, store it in row 25A, you know, on the yeah. top floor, you fill in the details for HMRC and that automatically goes into our blockchain note and it Brilliant. all gets stored in this. So it's not even an extra job task. You have to log that information anyway, and there it goes, ends up in the in the node, in, in the node, in the in the sky, in the, in the yeah. cloud. Yeah. Um, um, no, if anything, it's simpler because you know you don't have to worry about all the paperwork and the, the tra trail of paperwork and the rest of it. It goes in there and it stays there. Um, so that that's the, the sort of build up, the basis of it. That's the main. Yeah. That's what we're really doing it for. It's a stock system that can trace us all the way back. Because we grow, well, by the end of next year, we'll be growing 100% of our own barley uh, down here in Fife. So literally around where I'm sitting here. Wow. Um, the reason we haven't yet managed to do that is, is not because the farm can't cope. It's the in-between the farmer and the maltster. There isn't the infrastructure to dry and store oh, that okay. level, that quantity of barley and feed it through. Yeah. So the farm now is investing in us. Um, it was going to do it this year, but obviously lockdown and all the rest of it. Yeah. It's investing in us by building a, 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 a grain drying plant and, and storage so we can do it. Fantastic. So so we, we 100% grown in five for our number. Um, uh, we, might, we might occasionally, we have been dabbling in different uh, varietals and occasionally mm -hmm. we might go to Angus for a golden promise or, you know, whatever. whatever. But generally yeah. speaking, it's coming from here. Oh. So we can, we can trace back to the field um, and, the, and the date of harvest, which is fantastic. Um, like that. There's so many reasons I love blockchain technology. Coming from a food technology background, uh, my first job mm. was on the um, upscaling of Genius gluten-free bread, which is... Uh, oh, Lucinda. Yeah. yeah. Lucinda, and yeah, she's yeah. on the board with you. I know that. Yeah. Uh, so she obviously came up with this brilliant idea, and I was part of the MPD team then that developed it, upscaled it to, to mass production. Brilliant. And uh, it's so important that you know where that's like, pea substance came from or the because we don't use flour so we use like um, milled pea and so if there was something wrong with that batch then um they can yeah. trace it back like that it didn't take weeks or because people think that they that, that this, they live in a quite a secure uh way of finding information at right now but um it does take quite a while to trace back from when a th something was made or cooked or whatever, it takes months, sometimes weeks at least. So if with yeah. the blockchain technology, it can be done instantly. So from no, you, food safety, perfect. You hear stories about, um, I can't remember in America, people like Costco or whatever. Yeah. You know, they have to do a recall with blockchain technology. They can go straight to the original supplier. Whereas before they'd have to shut down 20, 30 suppliers because they didn't exactly. know which one had been the yeah. influencer. Until they traced it down and they had yeah. to sort of you know, do the whole investigation. No, I, I, I can see the benefits. I know the benefits in food, food science. Um, 
then I'm a nosy Nancy. I love the stories. Like, I can't believe, I, I, I just love the idea of uh, being able to scan a QR code and see the happy face of the farmer or, do you know, like <laughs> being able to get into the nitty gritty of what happened and even just knowing, oh, well, 11, 15, they added a, a yeast or, um, I, I don't know. It's just something I would really enjoy. And I think it just takes that risky enjoyment to a different uh, level. And it's, it's up to the person. You can buy a bottle and not bother with that. That's fine. You just enjoy the whiskey. But yeah. if you have that, in you and you're curious and you want to find out uh, I mean, yeah it's it's that that part of it the consumer facing part is, is brilliant it's it's very much the icing on the cake but yeah. it's so clever in what it can do it, it can engage the consumer if they want to be as you say mm -hmm. um but it can also allow us and i'm not saying this in at all a big brother way but purely for brand development we can track and trace where our bottles are going so yeah. you know they, they leave here in fife hopefully um, pallets of them, uh, yeah. truckloads of them, uh, <laughs> and disappear off to all corners of the globe. But we yeah. actually get to see that, you know, it's not just about the supply chain up to production and, and maturation and bottling, it's about leaving that warehouse mm -hmm. and arriving at someone else's warehouse, then into someone's shop, then into someone's, you know, whatever. We don't get to go literally into the nitty gritty of who's bought it, but we, we get that overall picture. Yeah. Um, which is, is great for brand building. It's also very good to prevent uh, parallel trading, uh, oh, which wow. is incredibly important for a new yeah. brand. Um, um, and then just become interactive. So, you yeah. know, we might want to say, um, now that you've enjoyed Gerard de Merkin, have you tried Heather's uh, shortbread from up the road? You know, yeah. it goes really well together. And you, you get this lovely kind of combination, a collaborative approach, which exactly. blockchain can do. Um, no, I think it's a great idea, and I, I, I do. I, I like how it doesn't just finish there where they buy the bottle. There is, uh, you can build on that relationship, and that person can give up as much information as they want, I suppose. Yeah. But that's not something I think one should feel guilty about because we live in a world now where my Tesco club card will tell that Tesco they know everything about me. They know when I need nappies, when I when I eat chocolate. You know, they know everything anyway. So. I don't know. That's I accept that that's the world we live in. And I, if if you worry about these things, I mean, we have to worry a little bit, of course. We don't well, want people bit, like that. It's a bit like getting your it's a bit like getting your gin and tonic refilled. Well, <laughs> that, was that blockchain technology? I think <laughs> See? Uh, it worked. Yeah. Percent of the time. No, um, I I'm for it. I think it's uh, it's nice to see that uh, you're taking it that bit further and and um, still like keeping it real and Scottish and it's your traditional methods or whatever, but it's just that once during production, bottling, and then when when the bottle goes to San Diego or Tokyo or, or Egypt or wherever it goes, you can yeah. you can talk about it. And, and that's your, your, I mean, I don't know, what how many thousand litres are you planning to, are you distilling, sorry? Um, so our optimal level is 400,000 yeah. um, litres of alcohol a year. We, we could go more than that, um, but part of the, the whole symbiotic relationship again with the estate. Yeah. Uh, if we go beyond that, we run out of cattle to feed. Uh, so you <laughs> then have to start moving it out off the peninsula. Yeah. We need some weight any... watchers for cattle. Exactly. <laughs> so it doesn't make any sense. Uh, um, so yeah, 400,000 litres, decent amount for a brand. Um, gives us a bit of extra that we can trade for fillings and things as well, if we want to. So 400,000 litres, so that's not, that's a really nice, neat, uh, you're not taking over the world. You're not going. No. That's nice. That's that. That's a nice size. Well, it's about, you know, if all goes to plan, it's probably a, it's probably a sort of fifty thousand nine liter case brand. In, in yeah. um, I'd like to say tomorrow, but it's going to be a few years before we get there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I'm just rethinking what you said. There. I, I like that the fact that you don't have enough animals to feed. That's what stops you making more whiskey. <laughs> well, no, but no, no joke. I mean, it, you know, people joke about tail wagging the dog, and yeah. and um. So well, with lockdown, uh, so most people started locking down, what, mid-March? Certainly by the end yeah, of March. 20, well, yeah, 15, 25, yeah, 15, 25, Um Distilleries obviously take a bit longer because you've got to mm. uh, ferment what you've mashed and distill what you've fermented and all the rest of it. Yeah. But we also had a very genuine obligation and, and absolutely 100% stuck to it that yeah. um, the farm, the, car, the, the, the cows were carving and they needed draft. So we couldn't just suddenly cut off their food supply. Oh, um, and it's all part of this lovely kind of 
Scottish, you know, uh, food and drink industry, the collaboration. I mean, go back centuries when whiskey distilling was a byproduct of cattle feed, basically. You know, you had your, your cow in the garden, which you fattened up to eat. Um, that was your most prized possession. And it yeah. just so happened that in taking it to the draft stage, if you fermented it and you could then distill it, so you get your beer and your whiskey on the back of feeding your cow. And now it's kind of flipped around a wee bit, but we're still, we've still got that relationship. It's um, still that relationship, yeah, exactly. It's very important. Waste not I love that. <laughs> it's, it's, it, and it's so genuine, I like that. I just, um, well, I'm just thinking there, uh, the blockchain technology, keeping the calves happy and uh, <laughs> focused. <laughs> I mean, there's definitely there's so well, many we ways. Do, I mean, <clears throat> one thing that we do want to do is, um, we've obviously trialled it with our spirit releases over the last three batches, just trying to get consumer feedback and also consumer awareness, because yeah. quite rightly, a lot of people are a bit kind of, oh, no, this is Bitcoin. You know, they don't really understand what else it is. Um, it's got a bit of a, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a natural fit with something as, as traditional as Scotch or potentially as traditional as Scotch. Um, so, yeah, a bit of consumer awareness, just talking them through the story, not quite in the level we're going to tonight, but... Um, <laughs> Um, but, and then the feedback is generally, yeah, can you make it more visual? Um, so yeah. rather than just a whole string of text about who filled what and who fermented what, yes. you know, can you, can we actually see that happening? Um, yeah. like a, either live or, or a make more an experience for the consumer and, and for them to yeah. share with their friends, because people buy whiskey to share. They don't just buy it and go home and drink, drink it. No, well, no. but so more it, or less. It's a balancing act because you obviously, you don't want to take away the whole charm of coming to Ardemarkin for the first time, or hopefully the second or the third time, yeah. but you want to just eke out enough to get people in. So yeah, yeah you, you want to show how amazing a place it is, the, the, the surrounding area, what we do in the distillery and all the rest of it. Um, I, re I reckon just... there's, some, there's definitely a way, like uh, people would love that and there'll be a way of uh, give and take and, and they'll get to know the area much better, Arden American, from their flat in yeah. San Diego. And then when they go over, the people that are in Arden American at the bed of breakfast might have heard of them through whatever blockchain technology. Who knows? Like there must be some kind of two-way communication that can go on at some point. But um, that it, I love it. Uh, it's, a, it's a modern word of mouth. I, I suppose that's one way of describing it. Yeah. Uh, and it does work very well. Um, Brilliant. No, I... I, I, I love it. And I think it'll help your, I mean, having worked for distilleries before and um, the questions you're always getting from uh, distributors across the wor world is they want more information about that cast. They want more information about yeah. that batch. They want more information about this. They always like information is king and, and being transparent just shows that look, we're not hiding anything. And uh, there you go. Just click on this and you can uh, download this app or you can go on this website and there you go the information is there everything you want to know is there for you so the distributor make, it makes it easier for them yeah. their staff but also for the shop owner that's in belgium you've got somebody standing selling cheese and whiskey and they can say well i think this whiskey and cheese will work well together because they're from whatever absolutely and and um it, you actually just touched on something else which it, it could do which is the next another next project stage of it because it's, it's never going to stop this. I mean, we've done no. the basics, but, you know. Um, so when you scan uh, the QR code with your iPhone or whatever it is, uh, generally speaking, you... Other phones your, are available. Uh, <laughs> your Android. <laughs> you've got your, um, um, whatever it is, uh, GPS thing on. So, you, you know, yeah. the locator. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will then feed back uh, to us that, that this bottle, number 217, has been bought in Berlin or, or Tokyo or, you know, Beijing or whatever. But it also potentially at that point, so you, you scan your thing, it, it realizes you're in Beijing, for example, it will then give you the opportunity of translating into Mandarin because it, it the, the suggested language of that area happens to be, you know. Um, so that, I mean, that's a lot of work down the line, but we can make it much more international. Brilliant. Great, uh, international oh my country. goodness. Yeah. Yeah, super excited about that. So you were the first distillery out with that. And I think I've noticed a few following on. Um, yeah, no, I mean, people have done it in different ways. We, we were certainly, we, we built the system with this company who were the first to yeah. do it. Um, mm -hmm. But we're very much encouraging, it's an open platform, so more the merrier. 
Um, yeah, exactly. It's like the whiskey world anyway. You know, we share yeah. experiences and the more you share, the more you learn. You work closely with Anthony and at yeah. Kilcoman and it helps, especially when you're a smaller producer. Uh, although he's doubled now, he's big. Is it 400 <laughs> now or <laughs> Uh, look, Kilhoman is fantastic. It's such an amazing place. And um, yeah. Anthony, over the years, I mean, we certainly wouldn't have built our uh, Demerkin. Well, I doubt we would have built it without his help. Um, he was so good. Oh, is that us. right? Oh, uh, he, 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 you know, I mean, he did say jokingly at the beginning, he said, look, if I'm going to answer all these questions you've got about building a distillery, when you've finished, anyone that comes to me, they're coming to you instead. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember and I, I thought, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So we did. We, we, we obviously did it and we were about three quarters of the way through the build and I got an email from what, uh, well, we had a number of emails from this, these people in South Africa and turned out they were the guys who then built Wolfman. <laughs> uh, but uh, what was actually quite funny because we were working with Forsyth, uh, as were they, we had uh, overseeing our project, we had Richard Forsyth Senior, they had Richard Forsyth Junior and he was out to prove to his father that he could do things, you know. And he managed to build Wolfburn quicker than, than we got to build our American. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's I mean, it better. You know, we had biomass boilers and stuff to cope with. But, yeah, it, was, it, it just shows that this, it, it's all about the knowledge being, the experience being, you know, uh, shared and passed on. It's of really, course. really important. Yeah, I yeah. love that element in the industry. Of, oh, it's, it's, it's special, very special. Um, yeah, I, great. Somebody asked the question why we were chatting about Arden American is about malting. So we've talked about how you're in the future going to be growing 100% of your own barley. Will yeah. you also be malting? So we do, we did build um, a, a malt floor at Arden American. Um, when you've got a biomass boiler, it, it produces a lot of residual heat. So yeah. you have to use it in the best you can. Um, so we heat all the houses and the from the visitor center and you know in the summer you literally you walk in uh, to the boardroom you've got to open all the windows it's so hot <laughs> <laughs> um but it also it, it the pipework runs through to what will be the kiln um so yeah. rather than having a traditional kiln with a uh, a fire underneath it we have a uh, huge great radiator just underneath what will be the the, the floor the bed if you like and that then takes the residual heat off the biomass boiler so basically free heat and a fan above it will then suck it up through the bed and hopefully dry. Ah, that's the concept. Like an um, underfloor heating kind of system, like that sort of way. Well, yeah, it's that, that, that's obviously drying uh, the, the germinated barley yeah. on, on the kiln. But the, the actual floor itself, which is relatively small, um, is divided into four sections. And under each section, there is, just as you get in a modern domestic property, there is mm. cold and hot uh, underfloor heating oh. or cooling. So yeah. we don't know if it will work yet, but we thought, well, look, we're putting a concrete slab in, let's just shove the pipes in. Um, the idea being that during the different process stages of malting, you know, germination, you want a cool floor or you want a warm floor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so warm to start, cool to, to, to carry on. So that adjustment will help us hopefully moderate the germination in, in terms of, but we don't know, it, it, it may not work. It may just be a, a gimmick. Um, so yeah, so the infrastructure is there. The it hasn't been commissioned yet because we've been too busy just building stock yeah. and spending money on important things like that. <laughs> um, going forward, as a sort of second phase, if you like, very much want to get it up and running. Um, yeah. We need to work out a steeping system and a sort of general handling system for it. Mm -hmm. um, even when it's fully operational, I don't see it doing more than about ten percent, probably maybe twenty okay. percent. Uh, it's just not big enough. No. as it is but what it will allow us to do if we want to is to specifically target uh special varietals so heritage crops for example i've yeah. uh, got great friends over in uh, east fife who run uh, crafty monsters uh, yeah. so they specialize in, in growing the with the um uh oh but yeah the heritage crops so all these old ancient varieties um so we could take maybe you know five tons off off a field and put it right the way through the system. Um, so yeah, it gives a bit of flexibility going forward. It does. It gives you a bit of a... You can play play with different strands or, or, yeah. or wrap of barley and 
and that just put me onto another thing. So that's great. So you've got that innovation that you can I can play around with, which is fantastic for any uh, brewer or for distiller that you have working. And uh, what about yeast? Are you are you playing with that? Are you are you going to try different things? No, I mean you know in in. <sighs> It's sort of fan, you can fantasize about wild yeasts and, and um, brewer's yeasts, especially. And I've seen it, especially in, in hotter climates, uh, distilleries where they know they're only going to get four or five years maturation before it all evaporates. So yeah. let's play around with the, the spirit and let's really go to town on yeast. We know our yields are going to go through the, the floor, um, but it doesn't matter because we've, we've, we've got a product on the market much quicker. Yeah. So, well, Star Wars, a classic example, they've, they've got some amazing um, yeast projects, if you like, um, yeah. right from the outset. I, I've always felt that in Scotland, given our climate and um, also the consistency of brand, I think, which is very, very important, um, I think you should home in on the yeast you want to use at the beginning or yeast and stick with it. Um, and we were lucky enough with Jim Swan um, in the early days who helped design the, the the plant and the product, if you like, the spirit. And he he basically set us up with the yeasts that we should use. So we okay. have two yeasts, um, two distillers yeasts. Um, okay. Having said that, I do think there is a lot to be said in Scotland with uh, changing the barley variety. And we've talked about this. Um, uh, we've seen it already. Uh, in, we've experienced it not by, um, um, well, more by luck than anything else. Uh, so our farmer moved uh, two years ago or last year, I can't remember now, from Concerto, which is, you know, everyone was using, moved to Laureate or Laureate, new variety, great variety for Scotland. Um, we started distilling that harvest for the first time in April last year. And Gordon, who runs the uh, production distillery, rang me up and he said, we've lost our fruit. You know, he walked into the tun room and the smell was completely different. And so we he could tell the yeah, we pride ourselves on having a really fruity spirit. Mm. Um, so they, they all credit to the team. And this goes back to right to the beginning, what we were talking about. Everyone is passionate. They all want to, you know, to make a, a difference. They went back to Jim Swan's notes. They remember what he had said about things like losing fruit and stuff. And they fiddled around the mash. They got the clearest wort possible uh, by stopping raking. They added a little bit more of one of the yeast. They, they changed the distillation just a, a bit more slowly, in the, the, okay. the cut, if you like. And uh, the following week, he ran me back and he said, it's like a sweetie shop in here. Um, oh, so that's so, uh, still using the, the new, new, new strand of barley. They yeah. managed to tweak it. Oh, and brilliant. It's extraordinary what the flavours were getting off it. So that, that proves the point that barley is incredibly important. Not yeah. so much where it comes from, although it's very nice to be able to have you know, a single farm if you want to, um, but about the, the strain, the variety. Mm. I think it's hugely okay. important. Oh, great. I love that. Uh, so, so, yeah, so that, that's a happy story. I'm glad. I'm, I'm just so impressed with your, your uh, distillery manager to pick up on the, on the notes. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it was him and, and his team. So, I mean, he's, he, he's been there six and a half years. Uh, he came in, he was the bus driver for Arden Murphy, for yeah. all the school kids. And we've been lucky enough to have some experience coming in and train up. Um, the, the, the guys who are from Arden American over the years. Yeah. So Gordon and Nicky have been there since the outset. And it was the two of them, Nicky remembered um, Jim Swan's um, uh, words of wisdom. And um, I yeah. mean, to live on. I mean, he did make a mark, didn't he? So many places. But that's so lovely really to hear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah great. Uh, we had a question about peat bogs. Have you got your own peat bogs? Because you're making peat as well, aren't you? You're doing both. Yeah, so at the moment, obviously, we're getting our, our barley peated by the maltster. <clears throat> so okay. we, we're getting that done in, um, well, Inverness, but also um, Alloa. Although, actually, no, it's not. It's, it, it, peating's up in, where is it? Anyway, it's, it's, it's Highlands. Uh, so the, the peat is Highland peat, which is what we should be getting. When, if and when, when, <laughs> we start <laughs> our own maltings, we are actually, we, the distillery is literally just under an old peat cutting. Uh, oh. on the hill um whether or not we do take it from there or from somewhere else on the peninsula assuming we're allowed to um so it wouldn't be a huge quantity anyway uh, we hope that and we did have some al analysis done on it right back at the beginning oh, right. we would hope that it would actually bring quite a maritime influence to it because it's yeah. we are right on the sea 
you are absolutely. I mean, I worry sometimes that you might fall into the sea if, if there was <laughs> a disaster because you're so close. You really uh, are. We're, we're a bit further than it looks on the photos, but yeah, we're probably the closest we are, probably 500 yards, maybe. A, um, yeah. Okay. Um, Lovely. So who bit, knows? Really you, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah. You've got that. Um, Two then that you could possibly start using some paint locally and if and when if it happens yeah yeah i mean given that the kiln is going to be heated by um residual heat from the boiler yeah. you don't have the opportunity to burn peat as a fire as a heater no. but you can you can put in a smoke box um so yeah it's like a modern version of it so you have yeah. the, the peat is burning for the smoke not for the for the drying yeah so it's not yeah exactly i've seen them actually yeah i've never thought of that you could use mm. that no, absolutely. That, that, that's, um, you have everything there. You really do. <laughs> well, yeah, it is a bit further to go to get it, but it, it is. It, it's a lovely little microclimate of, of goodiness. <laughs> Somebody's giving you some, um, some uh, marketing tips. Local barley, local peat. You have a bottle sold here. So <laughs> ah, <thanks laughs> <you can. laughs> well, just uh, send her an email and we'll sell you a bottle. No, I think uh, I think you're right, Phil. People like that. And you know what? You'll find it all out on the blockchain technology on your QR code. Yeah, it will be there. Amazing. <laughs> I've taken up so much of your time. I still have questions, though. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. I'm, I'm more happy. My, my glass is getting a bit lower than it was, but I've still got some more. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I won't keep you too far, too long. Um, now, let me see you here. So I love the way we heard about your background in the whiskey industry and your different whiskey ventures. That's been fantastic. Um, yeah, I no, actually, do you know what? I have actually touched on most things I wanted to ask you, so that's great. Um, I wanted to say your wife is one of the funniest people on social media. <laughs> she... So I don't know what it is, but so Vicky, Vicky, I met her once, I think, at Vice, and um, she she just, uh, she puts, one time I was coming off the tram, coming home from, a, I, I think I'd been in Royal Mile Whiskey, hanging around like I do there, for, like a bad smell, I love that yeah, place. All right. Anyway, she, she posted something about picking, she was going to a work uh, event, and she picked up the wrong uh, tights, pair of tights, I think she'd picked up number three's pipe, tights. <laughs> number three would have been your youngest daughter yeah. and I can that's something that I can relate to that's things I do although I have boys but I I, 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 I came off the tram and I just I saw her update about her trying to do a work event wearing, wearing tights that were down by her knees I laughed at so loud that somebody almost pulled an ambulance on me because I think it was falling over she just keeps doing it every every week there's something crazy I'm following so, the story about Noel, the chicken, who's hurt her legs uh, very yeah. closely. Yeah, well, uh, we're all hoping Noel has a swift recovery, but we'll see. But no, no, it's been great because, you know, when I've been on the road all these years, um, I mean, it, in the in the sort of the, the main part of that, I was away probably four or five months a year. Yeah. Um, and, it, yeah, it was, it was very sad not being around with the kids um, as much as I could have been. Yeah. But the the social media updates... I mean, it was like I was there the whole time. Yeah. Know, everything being fed through. And it's just so genuine. There's nothing, <laughs> nothing gets made up. It's all genuine. <laughs> I, can, I can tell. I've seen her, I've seen her mum doing her social media. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Yeah. I mean, the whole family, to be honest, because her brother, is, he, he's um, got this amazing second-hand bookshop down in Wigtown. Um, it's, Actually, it's the I, sounded, I read about that. It sounds yeah. great. Um, and he's written, what, two, I think he's on his third book now, um, The Diary of a Bookseller and everything. And it's just hilarious and so real. Um, I mean, it's like you're standing in the shop, you know, with him. Did you watch uh, Black Books? Yes, yeah. yeah. I don't know why I think about that, but I read the review in the New York Times or something about your brother-in-law's book. Yeah. And I haven't bought it yet, but I will, because it does sound uh, like a, great a, read. <laughs> a proper good read. So that's, you made a point there, actually. With lockdown, you have been... Uh, I was going to say forced to stay at home, but obviously it is quite a nice part of lockdown is that you spend time with your family yeah. and you get to know them and eat a bit better. <laughs> I know we had, we had everyone home. I mean, my eldest who's second year at um, Glasgow. Uh, uh -huh. We hardly ever see her and she came home for three months. It's fantastic. Oh. She's had to go back to work now, but um, yeah, it's been brilliant having everyone here. Yeah. Um, and been really, really... Been able to travel, obviously with the lockdown. 
Yep. Uh, you yeah. just made it out of New Zealand because I was watching. I was thinking, are you and Cornwall going to leave soon? Because you're still there and all these things are going on. So I know that Dave Room ended up staying in New Zealand yeah. for a bit longer yeah. than we planned. So it was all a bit weird. We we went straight to New Zealand, literally. We, we took the first time I've ever done it. We did the Dubai Auckland flight, which is one of the yeah. longest commercial flights you can do. Um, oh. Normally I go through Australia and then down. Um, and then once, so we were there for the, 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 the most amazing whiskey fair, which I've been to every year since it started, which is Dramfest. Um, Dram absolutely Fest. brilliant. And um, after that, we were due to go up to Australia and do, I think, 10 days on the road. We did, I think, Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide and Perth. Everything lined up, all great. So it was all fine. We were all obviously aware of what was going on, just beginning to come through in the headlines. But everything yeah. was fine. Dramfest, absolutely brilliant. Uh, we landed in Sydney and there was a message from, I can't remember if it was from Dave or someone else. I think it might have been from Dave. Basically, he'd come down from Australia to Dramfest, having done a, a film screening of Amber Light, obviously, mm. the film, um, in, I think, Melbourne. It might have been Sydney, uh, in a small cinema. And you can imagine that the whole crowd, it was packed out, the whole crowd were basically whiskey geeks and, you know, people. Oh, yeah. 80% of that crowd, or not 80, maybe 50%, including Dave himself, then moved down to Dramfest. Yeah. And after the Dramfest Fest weekend was finished, and this text we got was that someone who'd gone to that film screening was tested positive. Oh, what? So poor Dave was then in lockdown. He literally had to self-isolate. He was there on holiday after Dramfest. And he, he had to, with his family, had to self-isolate for two weeks. <clears throat> and he was looked after great, you know, by yeah. Fraser Miller. I saw his updates. I mean, he was <clears throat> suffering, let's be honest. <laughs> no, but, of course, by the time his isolation had finished, he couldn't get out of the country because all the flights had stopped. So he, he was there for literally months. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, so we, we'd, we'd skirted around all this. I mean, I suppose, in theory, we might have been exposed to a dram fest because of the influence from Australia, but who knows? Mm. But anyway, we scattered around it. We did Melbourne. We got up to Sydney. And then um, my chairman rang me um, and said, no, nah, you're coming home. <laughs> it's a lot more serious here than it is there. Um, and we got one. We did actually manage to get one of the last flights. Um, oh. And, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I was kind of curious to see when you were going to make it back, <laughs> uh, back into uh, the UK soil again. And uh, obviously watching as well. Um, I followed Dave Broom on his Instagram and you, I could see his pictures coming up there and I realised he was stuck. Yeah. Um, I loved it how he had the little um, cuddly kiwi thingy in yeah. front of him to show that he was in New Zealand. <laughs> yes! I mean, to be honest, the weather kind of said it wasn't Scotland. <laughs> Yeah. And I, 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 New Zealand is, is one of the countries that have been dealing phenomenally. Like they've had a great uh, response to COVID. And then uh, today on the news, they have two new cases. People flown in from the UK. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? We'll, we'll never get let back. Oh, <clears throat> it's what it is. I know. I, um, I had, there was a question actually, uh, which, okay, I'll ask it because it, it came up and, and then we will round up because you do have a life to live. I'm so sorry you're taking up so much of your time. Um, any future releases? You've mentioned something coming out in July. What else have you got coming out now, Adelphi Wise? And of course, Arna Markham, what's happening? Um, so Adelphi Wise, we have, oh, Connell's going to kick me for not knowing this off the top of my head. I think it's about... He might so, still be there. You can help. <laughs> yeah. It's between 10 and 13 casks coming out in July. Wow. Um, so it's quite a big one. We, yeah. We found some really good, I mean, this Blair Apple is absolutely stunning. Um, <coughs> we uh, are bottling something. I mean, so one of your original questions was, um, do we hang on to things or do we just bottle, you know, as soon as we buy them? Yeah. With the very, very few exceptions, we sometimes do hang on to things because we think this might be even more amazing, you know, in uh -huh. a few years. And I've managed to, I don't know how I've done it. Uh, the temptation has been great. Uh, we've managed to hang on to one of our early Breath of Islas. So unnamed Isla, uh, single malt. Um, and it's just turned 21. <gasps> oh. and I have to say it is one of the most amazing Isla whiskies I've ever tried. It's, oh. it's like a fruit bomb, um, followed by this beautiful, soft uh, smoke. And it just, oh. you know, you just don't want to stop sipping away at it, which is terrible. Um, anyway, unfortunately, in its 21 years, it's been leaking quite badly. 
So there's only oh, going to be about two bottles, isn't there? <laughs> no, we reckon we'll get about 160 bottles out of the cask. Um, oh. uh, so that will be there. It sadly won't be that cheap, but it will be there, and it is exceptional. Um, and yeah, just some some lovely more. There's a lovely liquid sherry. Um, this Blair Athol. There's a Ben Rear. Um, <laughs> what was that? Well, so who who were they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I must say the Blair Athol 13 <laughs> that you were mentioning. I'm going to look out for that one. I might go and see. Uh, so can you get these in the UK or uh, like in Europe or? So, uh, again, Tom's going to shoot me for this, but it, as far as I'm aware, it's a general release. Quite often we just target certain markets but i think this is going to everyone okay um, which is good news and bad news good news is it will be widely available but there'll be less of it because it has to so, be uh, okay so coral is helping us glenore oh. coming out mortlach coming out oh yeah 17 year old mortlach oh the glenore oh. the glenore is amazing it's an 18 year old refill bourbon and it's got this aftertaste of i don't know it's like it's like a sort of um um strange relation between a peat smoke and, and coal smoke is just the most extraordinary smoke really really vivid um i absolutely love a glenord and bourbon cast so that's quite interesting i'm, uh, I'm not that? sure why he's doing an angry face where's he made and what's the... maybe i'm not meant to tell anyone ashley there we go <laughs> oh ashley <laughs> <laughs> he's keeping you right so that's he what is. he's doing yeah and you've got he says also there's 10 releases so uh, that's good so that's quite but that's still quite a big release yeah and um, so that's the Adelphi, and you said it can, you think it's available uh, Europe wide. Well, obviously, lockdown permitting. Uh, people can, I notice people's habits of, uh, I, say, I refer to people because the only people I'm talking about now is this person. <laughs> <laughs> you buy online or you buy when you go food shopping. So I take it that's how you're, you're, you're having to deal with things at the moment as well. People are buying from we, online yeah, shops. Yeah, from our point of view, because we don't really sell direct. Uh, we really haven't seen, if anything, we've seen uh, an acceleration. Um, we haven't seen a downturn at all. And there were, early on in lockdown, there were a couple of markets who couldn't, um, logistically couldn't import because their warehouses were closed. And being a, a duty-free, um, you know, an, a, a tax-free or an under-bond commodity, yeah. you, you need a receiving warehouse. Yeah. Um, but, but other than that, it's been plain sailing. I mean, we've had orders going as far as New Zealand, Taiwan, Japan, yeah, yeah, all over the place. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it should be widely available, but just in very small amounts. Uh, which is yeah, no, place. of course. <laughs> it is It is what it is, especially something that's 21 years old from Isla, and uh, you're saying there's 150 bottles. Um, great, so that's what it's coming out from Adelphi in July. Now, the big, I, I can't do a drum roll without sounding like a, <laughs> a, I, I need medication. So let's not do it, but drum roll, are yeah. working? What's happening? Yeah. So the plan was, uh, right before all, all everything changed, the plan was that we would have um, a launch party on, uh, in the middle of September and uh, in our Demerkin for our overseas agents. And yeah. then the whiskey would be released end of the month, beginning of October, uh, and, and wind its way to all the corners of the earth in time for Christmas. Uh, so part of that plan has changed. We can't have yeah, it on, well. the, on the ground launch, but <laughs> we are now quite well uh, sort of in tune with how to do it. We yeah. have every, um, we are working as hard as we can. And it's not just about the whiskey, it's about the packaging and getting everything ready. Yeah, uh, so we are working as hard as we can to maintain that launch window. Uh, so I sound like Elon Musk here. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, which will be basically end of September, beginning of October. Okay. Um, and as soon as we're allowed, uh, we'll be up at the distillery, uh, starting to put the actual whiskey together, sampling hundreds of casks and, and all that <laughs> lovely stuff. <laughs> so that's the plan, because you obviously have the bottle, you have the packaging, you just need to decide on how you... The bottle and the packaging is new, it's still in progress. Um, oh. it's, it's an evolution of the spirit, it's not the same bottle. Oh, okay. Um, so, but everyone is, has guaranteed that it's going to be ready in time. Right? So <laughs> yeah, I'm I love now, that. I'm now switching focus, although I'm still very focused on that. I'm now switching Loads focus. can be done on Zoom. Don't order us a bit of Zoom. <laughs> and a bit of tea. Yeah, a bit of paper, paper bag whiskey. Yeah, <laughs> um, no, so yeah, basically all being well, everything ducks in line, all the rest of it. Uh, October, Brilliant. end of September, Brilliant. beginning of October. And we aim so to that's... have, yeah, we aim to have the first proper batch, which is, you know, as it will continue to be, 
the sig signatory um, um, Arden American, uh, signature, cool. sorry, that was a, a pun, a slip of the tongue, <laughs> a signature <laughs> Arden American, uh, uh, which will be somewhere between 12 and 15,000 bottles for each batch. Okay. And alongside that, we certainly plan to launch a special um, Woohoo kind of single cask uh, as the first. Um, <laughs> what did you say, a special what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> um, I think I've had one of them before, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and, and that obviously then leads leads up the possibility of being able to do more single cars going forward as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, two, two, two launches together, basically. So is Arden American selling whiskey to Adelphi? <laughs> That's actually a very good question, because the two companies are separate. Um, oh, really? uh, I was actually joking, but that. No, no, for, for no particular reason, it's just when we started building the place and spending far too much money, um, <laughs> we decided to, rather than make Adelphi look like it was doing absolutely appallingly every year, accounting wise, we decided to separate the company. So we had like oh, a, build, a distillery and, a, and a, a thingy. We've now kind of returned into a group, but we've kept the two companies separate. Yeah. The idea long term is we'll merge the whole thing into one. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, yes, the simple answer is Arda Merkin basically sells the whiskey to Adelphi who bottles it. No, there won't okay. be any money changing hands. It will be a paper exercise. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the, okay. the, the process. Be like, oh. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, I, I, I we, this is, the, I've set my own world record by chatting with you. And <laughs> actually, you've opened more questions and there has been more questions <laughs> coming out. Um, so I, uh, I have to stop because otherwise we'll be here forever. And I know you have, uh, a family and a uh, chicken to look after so I will leave <laughs> I, I will let you do so um, yeah I'm looking at my, I don't even know why I'm looking at all my questions there's too many um, this could be a part two <laughs> <laughs> well maybe in October <laughs> yeah, no, I know for the big launch yeah. somebody did ask about does London get a launch but um, I, we well, just I don't know, know. Just, just on that I mean there are still the big fairs which are still in theory taking place but we don't know we are booked in to be at uh, the London Whiskey Show. We yeah. are booked in to be at, for the first time, uh, Whiskey Live Paris, okay. uh, Taiwan, uh, probably like a few others, but we just don't know. So. No, so the thing that Scott said yesterday from Tomat, and he, he said, as much as you can have these events booked ahead, there's going to be limitations to how many people come to these shows, even though the venue might take a thousand people, but you might only be allowed 25%. So I we know. just don't do we we just have to take it it's and you know you, you also have a responsibility to your own team um, yeah if there's any reason why they shouldn't be traveling then it's as simple as that they shouldn't be traveling um yeah. and i include myself in that too <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> um so yeah but look, look at we, this. We all, we, enjoy this. this is fantastic I know. I know. um no i don't know what the next thing's going to be after after um the kind of zoom or instagram way of doing things maybe we'll well like we did a whiskey dinner the other night the yeah. more the kind of scratch and sniff element, you know, brought in. Absolutely. <laughs> scratch and sniff. Yeah. We might need to work on the title. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Oh, oh yeah, Alex, that's been brilliant. I think few people have commented and said it's been great. And you you're uh, I've really enjoyed it. And so I've learned so much. Oh no, no, it's been great just being able to talk about it because you know, so much of the time you, you're very aware that um there's either an hour or, uh, well, we, we had an hour, but yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. or there's other things to talk about. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, you're very good at asking the right questions. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, well, thanks, Alex. And thank you, everybody that's been watching. I will put it up on YouTube uh, if Alex allows me to. If it doesn't come up, then he said no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, uh, good luck. Like that, and you and Conal have been doing a great job during lockdown, uh, doing the digital media and just been there. I've seen a few of your uh, chats and oh, reading. Yeah. Really <laughs> um, so good. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks, Take care. Cheers, Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.